Thank you very much. Uh, I'm <laughs> I'm speaking to you uh, from about uh, 100 meters east of uh, Jack's house in my <laughs> in I my see. house, uh, despite the background you see of the uh, Yale Quantum Institute. And uh, it's a, a pleasure for me to be here. I sadly I've had to uh, miss uh, uh, most of the meeting because I've been uh, chairing a scientific advisory board uh, of the, the Swedish national effort in quantum computing, but I'm glad to have a chance to talk to you about uh, some things we've been thinking about in circuit QED, microwave, superconducting, uh, photons interacting with artificial atoms, Josephson junction um, qubits. And uh, yeah, the work I'm going to tell you about has been going on for a while, but it's uh, now uh, part of this uh, uh, national uh, DOE quantum information science research center that I direct. And uh, if I could get my slides to advance. Uh, so one of the things that's nice about this center is I, first time in my life, I have a chance to talk to um, computer scientists. And, and uh, so we're trying to develop an instruction set architecture, a set of instructions that you can use in hybrid qubit oscillator systems to generate uh, universal control or, or arbitrary unitaries for uh, inside your quantum system or your quantum computer. One of the design tools that we're hoping to deliver eventually is an extension to the uh, Qiskit language, which is was built uh, to as a representation of uh, qubits. Uh, extend that to oscillators by um, tell, uh, having it represent the Fox states of, um, of an oscillator, the first uh, two to the n levels of an oscillator in terms of n levels of, uh, in the terms of the levels of uh, n qubits. And we're also interested in uh, the my uh, postdoc Michelin Soli is interested in uh, sort of designing optimal control pulses to realize the, each of the elements in this instruction set very accurately. So we're interested in a hybrid discrete variable, continuous variable hardware. So the discrete variable is um, uh, superconducting qubit. It's not literally two levels, but it's anharmonic enough. You can approximate it as a two level system coupled to microwave resonators, which are very close to harmonic um, um, oscillators. And you can have a kind of uh, a traditional uh, circuit QED architecture, which I would call discrete variable dominant. You have transmon qubits, uh, as the primary carriers of the information. Uh, and they communicate with each other via virtual microwave photon exchange through uh, an intermediate resonator, a kind of quantum bus. Uh, but we've become, and this has become kind of the dominant uh, architecture in the, uh, in the industrial world, uh, IBM and Google and Rigetti and so forth. Uh, but since developing this, we've become interested in, an, in another version which inverts this and puts the quantum information into superpositions of Fox states of microwave photons and high Q resonators. Uh, but because they're harmonic oscillators, you can't, you don't have universal control over them unless you have ancilla nonlinear elements that provide three or four way mixing. And for us, that those will be objects, uh, either the transmons that were the qubits before, or, or some related uh, circuit involving a Josen junction that gives you uh, an harmonicity. So, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about 
quantum control and measurement of such hybrid systems, um, uh, both theory and experiment. Here are a couple of recent theory overviews of ways to um, do uh, create non-Gaussian states and, and achieve universal control over these hybrid systems. There's a very interesting recent preprint from Ai Chuang's group at MIT. Uh, uh, it's, um, it's written for ion traps, but we're thinking about uh, uh, how we might take advantage of some of the ideas um, in this paper in which your control pulses are guaranteed to move you around in the harmonic oscillator uh, Hilbert space, but never go above, provably never go above a certain maximum uh, boson number. So it's a, it's a very interesting paper. Okay, so here's our basic Hamiltonian setup. We have some kind of uh, microwave resonator with a Q of, uh, you know, 100 million or half a billion. Uh, there is a Josephson junction qubit inside uh, that has a, you know, it's a macroscopic object on a millimeter scale. It has enormous uh, dipole coupling to the uh, microwave mode. Um, um, uh, 100,000 times larger um, uh, vacuum Rabi coupling uh, uh, than you would achieve if this were an atom sized object instead of a millimeter sized object. And uh, so we have the harmonic oscillator of a single mode of the cavity. We have the uh, qubit Hamiltonian, which I'll just write as a projector onto the excited state. It's a two-level system. And then a four-wave mixing term, unlike the three-wave mixing that Jack just showed, in which there's a couple, there's a, a dispersive coupling, provided that the qubit and the cavity are at strongly different frequencies, uh, perhaps 20% different. Uh, between the, in, uh, the photon number in the cavity and the excitation number in the qubit. On top of that, we'll have a linear drive on the cavity to displace it and a Rabi drive with an adjustable amplitude and phase on the qubit. And because this dispersive coupling is enormously strong, it can be uh, a thousand line widths, thousand times larger than the line width of the cavity or the atom. Uh, you can do remarkable things. You can displace the cavity conditioned on the state of the qubit. You can rotate the qubit conditioned on the state of the cavity. And uh, together, these provably give you universal control as described in, uh, in this uh, paper from Liang Zhang's group. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Here's just a pretty picture of, from uh, the Sholkoff group uh, showing the kind of universal control that's available. Here's a 3D uh, post uh, superconducting cavity. There's a, a drive for the cavity. There's the ancilla um, transmon. There's a uh, readout resonator for the transmon. There's a drive you can put in on the transmon. And using, uh, once the Hamiltonian is calibrated, we can compute uh, an optimal control pulse that uh, two, whose two quadratures shown in blue here are on the transmon and two shown uh, driving the cavity. And we can deterministically take the system from the ground state of the qubit and ground state of the oscillator to ground state of the qubit and the n equals six Fox state of the uh, cavity. Um, here you see the population, measured population distribution peaked at six. Here you see the Wigner function of the resulting state. This is the, you know, position and momentum of the uh, cavity oscillator. 
And uh, this data is relative, this kind of tomography is relatively easy to do experimentally. And the key enabling resource is the ability to uh, use this strong dispersive coupling to measure the photon number parity. So you can measure the Wigner function by just uh, displacing a point in phase space to the origin and measuring the average parity. It's very uh, simple and direct. Uh, 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 tomography. All right, so the thing I've learned from talking to computer scientists uh, who are thinking ahead to the days when we'll have quantum computers with thousands or, or millions of qubits, uh, it's not possible to use optimal control theory pulses individually designed for each of the thousand qubits to uh, generate an arbitrary unitary you know, operation to execute some algorithm uh, on your quantum computer. The only way you can do this reliably in a, in a system sense is to create a discrete instruction set architecture. Uh, and um, it has practical advantages. And it also allows theorists to reason about the software and algorithmic complexity uh, of um, a particular task. Uh, how many of the standard, how many times do you have to apply these standard gates? What's the circuit cost? And, uh, and it's really what you have to do to build stable modular systems. So um, we can of course have simple uh, uh, qubit rotations around essentially any axis then do those in a way that's independent of the state of the cavity. I'll call those unconditional ancilla gates. I can have unconditional Gaussian operations on the resonator uh, independent of the ancilla with um, you know, displacement of the oscillator, um, uh, uh, rotation of the state and phase space. That's just a trivial change in the in your uh, phase of all the subsequent uh, drive amplitudes. Um, using four wave mixing from ancilla transmons, it's uh, fairly easy to get uh, squeezing, um, you know, up to maybe 10 dB, eight to 10 dB. Uh, two mode beam splitters, which are also frequency converting. Uh, can can uh, connect two different resonators at different frequencies as if they were degenerate and connected by an optical beam splitter. And uh, same with um, two mode squeezing. So those are, you know, standard Gaussian operations. Um, but we're interested in non Gaussian operations and ones that entangle a qubit and silica qubit and the cavity using this strong dispersive coupling. And as I said, this coupling is so strong that you can very highly resolve the individual peaks in the qubit spectrum, the transition frequency of the qubit from ground to excited state uh, shifts by the uh, changes by the uh, dispersive pull. Uh, I've changed units, so it should be chi, not two chi here. Um, each time you add a photon to the cavity, the qubit transition frequency shifts by uh, hundreds or thousands of line widths. And so you can apply a microwave tone at this particular qubit frequency, the one that, and it'll be on resonance if and only if there's exactly one photon in the cavity. Uh, and therefore effective at rotating the qubit around some arbitrary axis in, in the xy uh, plane of the block sphere uh, by an amount and around an axis that's determined by the phase and amplitude and duration of this qubit drive. So you can define a little quantum circuit here, which conditionally applies this particular rotation of the qubit uh, 
if and only if there are exactly n photons in the cavity. And you can choose what n is by changing the frequency of the drive tone. So uh, one interesting thing you can do with a pair of such operations is to uh, ro start with the qubit in the ground state, rotate it up to the uh, north pole, uh, let's say around the x-axis, and then change the phase of the drive and rotate it back to the ground state around an arbitrarily chosen other axis, perhaps the y-axis, perhaps some axis that's uh, uh, closer to x. And as a result of that, you can control the area on the block sphere swept out as the, uh, by this trajectory and get a phase kickback uh, which is uh, the Berry phase of that uh, trajectory, which is applied if and only if there are exactly n photons. And you can have a different phase for each, different Berry phase for each photon number in the cavity. And all of these uh, things, because they're at different frequencies, can be done in parallel. So you can execute this so-called snap gate in which you apply a uh, different, you, you keep the photon number distribution, but you change the phase arbitrarily for each Fox state. And this turns out to be an extremely powerful uh, gate which when combined with simple cavity displacements gives you universal control. So this is a, here's a, a nice paper by Fissel et al. Um, in which you do cavity displacements, you do these snap gates and you just alternate them and you uh, adjust the parameters in these uh, gates until you approach whatever unitary it is that you're trying to produce. And the, the transmon always starts in the ground state and ends in the ground state. So here you see, for example, a simulation of producing one of the family of binomial quantum error correction code states. It's a superposition of zero and six photons is one code word and a superposition of three and nine photons is the other code word. And this quantum error correction code has, uh, uh, is capable of correcting two uh, photon losses as well as uh, one dephasing event. And uh, here you see the theoretical Wigner function for some particular combination of these two code words. And here you see the convergence of this um, sequence of um, instructions, of discrete instructions to the desired unitary. Here the infidelity after only a, a sequence length of four is already you know, effectively zero. So this, uh, this is a very efficient way to produce arbitrary unitaries uh, from a discrete instruction set. Um, an alternative uh, instruction set built from pulses that act with the same dispersive Hamiltonian is um, a controlled, an ancilla controlled cavity displacement. When the qubit is in state zero, you displace the cavity in phase space by plus alpha. And when the qubit is in one, you displace the cavity by minus alpha. And that together with a, a, a controlled rotation of the cavity controlled by the qubit, which is the, this is the native Hamiltonian that's available to us. So this is easy to do. Um, plus single qubit rotations gives you a, a different alternative instruction set that can also uh, make essentially anything. So here's a, an example of how to do this controlled displacement 
Uh, and you might, you can, see, you can see there's some this interaction between the qubit and the cavity, so there should be a way to do this. But you would think that the dispersive shift would set the speed limit for how rapidly you can do that. But uh, this paper shows experimentally a very clever scheme for beating that speed limit. So we're going to turn on a drive on the oscillator, go to a displaced frame to eliminate that drive. And then uh, we will, uh, plugging this into here, we see a term we want, a classical control times a three-wave mixing term that conditionally displaces the oscillator either in position or momentum, depending on the phase of this uh, displacement. And then some terms that we do not want that we need to echo away. And so, um, here is a picture of phase space and to illustrate certain rotations that are going to happen and have to be uh, echoed away that from this term, I'm going to show you a little cartoon with a starting with a squeezed state. And um, the protocol is you apply a Hadamard to the ancilla to take it to an equal superposition of uh, ground and excited so that I can get uh, two different displacements, uh, plus alpha and minus alpha. And then I'm going to uh, turn on the drive. And then I'm going to turn on the opposite drive like this, then a, a pi pulse to, to flip the qubit to echo away these terms. And then I'm going to so reverse the qubit state and reverse the drive sequence. So this term will uh, survive and this term will be echoed away. So here's a little cartoon of what happens. First, you displace to the right. You see there's some unwanted rotation beginning to happen here. You uh, then displace back to the left. Then you flip the qubit, interchanging ground and excited. And then you reverse the drive sequence on the cavity. And at the end, you have a beautiful uh, displacement, in this case in momentum, uh, with no unwanted um, uh, rotation of the qubit or of the cavity because this term has been echoed away. This can be done in about 120, uh, 20 times faster than the rate chi. Uh, the time it takes to do the gate just uh, goes down and down as you make the strength of this displacement larger and larger. Here going up to alpha of 20 corresponding to as many as 400 microwave photons in the cavity. So the whole gate can be done much faster than you might have uh, thought. And it's convenient for technical reasons to reduce the size of the dispersive coupling uh, and then speed up the gate using this trick. So here's a, <laughs> one of my favorite pieces of quantum mechanics uh, uh, recognizing that translations in phase space uh, don't commute. So we're going to do a, we're going to calibrate these control displacements by doing a Hadamard on the qubit, a control displacement that takes the uh, cavity uh, to the left if the qubit is in zero and to the right if the qubit is in one. Then we're going to do an unconditional displacement that doesn't care what the state of the qubit is. So both blobs move up this way. Then we're going to do the reverse conditional displacement. And all of these are this echoed, each of these is this echoed trick. Uh, we're going to move the blobs back together in phase space and then move them together down to here. So if the qubit is in zero, the oscillator went around this way in phase space. And if the qubit is in one, the oscillator went around this way in phase space. And so they pick up opposite geometric phases. 
And therefore, there's a phase kickback on the qubit. And if you measure the qubit, you will see that it has rotated. And here's the experimental data showing uh, the beautiful uh, sort of Ramsey Berry fringes of as you make the size of the, the phase space excursion, this area larger and larger. And so this is a, an extremely powerful way to calibrate the displacement uh, that you in units of photon, you know, square root of photon number that you are applying with your signal generator to the cavity. It's a really beautiful uh, experiment from uh, Michelle Devere's group. And using this simple control displacement uh, trick, uh, they're able to make uh, Gottesman, Kataya, Presco, Bosonic quantum error correction uh, code states and stabilize their manifolds. These are essentially like uh, Schrodinger cat states that live in 35 places at once in phase space. Uh, this is not actually the Wigner function. This is the characteristic function, which is a sort of Fourier transform of the Wigner function. And it's very simple to measure. You do a control displacement and you look at the phase kickback uh, on the ancilla from that. And that directly tells you uh, this uh, the overlap of the original state and the displaced state, which is precisely the um, characteristic function of the state and equivalent. It's full tomography. It's equivalent to the Wigner function. Uh, similar work has been done in uh, ion traps uh, uh, in in uh, in the uh, Zurich group. Okay, so that's. Uh, something about control, what about measurement? And uh, so we need to be able to do photon number resolving measurements. So we might wanna ask the question, is the photon number equal to one, yes or no? So that, that will give us one bit of information. Uh, is it equal to 13, yes or no? Uh, but it's not a very efficient way to sample the photon number because if there are, say, 256 possible photon numbers, the answer is likely to be no most of the time. So it uh, it's, uh, has a large uh, query complexity, is inefficient sampling, but it's easy to understand. So we'll start with this and then we'll show you something better. So we use this... Um, uh, capability of having a controlled unitary, a rotation, in this case, a pi pulse around the x-axis on the ancilla, conditioned on there being exactly m photons in the cavity. And then we simply measure the ancilla to see if it flipped. If it did, then the state of the cavity collapses to Fox state m. If this does not flip, the state of the cavity collapses to whatever it was before minus uh, the uh, state M. So again, this works the same way I showed you by applying tones uh, at a frequency selected to flip the qubit depending on how many photons there are in the cavity. But we can ask um, uh, more subtle questions. Is the photon number equal to either one or three? Yes or no? I don't, I'm not, I don't wanna learn whether it's one or three. I just wanna know whether it's either one of those. And you can do that by applying simultaneous tones like this. And if the qubit flips, you know there was either one photon or three, but you don't know which. And more generally, you can extend this controlled unitary to measure any binary valued function of the photon number in a quantum non-demolition way. I, you know, we're just uh, rotating the qubit if a, photon is, a particular photon number is present, but we're not eating up the photons. And so what do I mean by a binary valued function? I have this set of projectors onto different photon number states and I can form a, a, a vector C whose entries are zeros and ones 
that select out some set of photon numbers. And I'm, if any of those are occupied, then I want to flip the qubit. So I can use this to do a very efficient uh, binary search to find the photon number rather than uh, doing tomography by saying, uh, what's the probability there are zero photons? What's the probability there are one photons? I'm going to do a binary search and sample from the photon number distribution and get a result every time. This time the photon number was three, next time it was 13 and so forth. So it's uh, exponentially more efficient, it turns out. And the, the way you do it is you, you measure the walsh hadamard transform of the, of the photon number. You start with this um, set of projectors and this, uh, this, this guy will flip the qubit if and only if uh, the photon, so these are the photon, this, uh, each of these corresponds to a different photon number running from zero to I think 15. Uh, and this guy will flip the qubit if the photon number is in the upper half of the range uh, zero to 15. I then measure the uh, uh, qubit to see what happened that partially collapses the state. Then I apply this conditional <clears throat> unitary and find out whether the photon number is in the upper half or the lower half of whichever half this guy picked out and so forth down the line until the final measurement just measures the photon number parity. And, um, so you can extract the binary digits in the representation of the photon number from each of these four measurements. If this measurement is different than that measurement, it means that this guy flipped, um, flipped the uh, qubit. And by uh, combining the measurement results in this way, you can get all four, up to four binary digits uh, in the photon number. And thus, as a result, the circuit costs, if you're, you're able to sample up to some n max number of photons, the circuit depth is only log base two of that. And it's exponentially more efficient than ask, asking, are there zero photons? Are there one photon? Are there two? Are there three? And you get, so it's true boson sampling uh, and exponentially more efficient. So we can use this, um, <clears throat> this uh, ability to make non-trivial measurements and control to, uh, to build a toolbox for hardware efficient simulation of physical models containing bosons. We can also use this for hardware efficient bosonic quantum error correction, but I, I don't have time to talk about that. So I'm going to tell you about an experiment, a quantum simulation of the optical spectra of vibrating molecules. We're going to, we're going to solve, compute with this simulator, the Frank Condon factors for some molecules, treating it as a boson sampling problem. So it's, uh, it's a kind of Gaussian boson sampling, but a boson sampling is where you have a network of beam splitters, you put in Fox states, and then you measure the photon number distribution at the different output ports. And all the interferences make this in principle uh, difficult to compute uh, classically if you have a large enough system. Uh, we're going to be using a very small system with just two modes. So we're, we're not going to beat uh, classical computers, but it's, it's an interesting simulation. So the hardware efficiency comes from representing the mechanical vibrations of the nuclei in small molecules uh, in terms of the electromagnetic oscillations of two microwave oscillators. So we're gonna look at triatomic molecules, for example, ozone and, and uh, uh, in this case, so water and um, um, we're going to look at the symmetric stretch 
uh, eigenmode and the anti-symmetric bending eigenmode. And one cavity will represent stretch and the other bending. There'll be ancilla transmons, which uh, give us universal control over these and uh, also um, uh, two, two mode uh, control. And the idea behind uh, this such optical spectroscopy, or in this case, we're gonna look at photo emission, uh, high energy photon comes in and ejects an electron from one of the chemical bonds, let's say the one on the left. So this has now um, changed the spring constant of this bond, and it's broken the, ref the left-right reflection symmetry in the molecule. As a result, it displaces, uh, squeezes, and mixes the two normal modes because it breaks the reflection symmetry. Another way to say it is that these, think of the, uh, vibrational coordinates, the bend coordinate and the stretch coordinate in are moving on a potential energy surface, the blue one, uh, which is aligned with these uh, symmetry chosen axes. But after you eject, you break one of the bonds, the whole potential energy surface changes spring constants uh, and gets displaced and gets rotated to a new, uh, new direction uh, because these are no longer uh, good symmetry directions. And our, the name of the game is to start with some particular vibrational state here and project it onto the eigenstates of the new potential energy surface to find the probability distribution of the number of different vibrations that you leave behind. That's called, uh, chemists call that the Doctorov transformation. And uh, people in traditional quantum optics have thought about how to build simulators doing this. You need bosonic modes, you need Gaussian operations, beam splitters, squeezing displacements, and importantly, rotations between the modes. That's what the beam splitters do. You need non-Gaussian state preparation and you need number resolved detection. Here are circuit QED references where these things have capabilities have been achieved. They can be done in conventional quantum optics, but of course it's uh, a bit more challenging. So here is the uh, circuit implementation of our quantum simulation uh, done by Chris Wang and Rob Sholkoff's group and published here. So again, there's two cavities, Alice and Bob, or uh, stretch and bend. Uh, it, there's an ancilla coupled to each, and there's a coupler ancilla that couples the two together. You start with non-Gaussian state preparation in which you initialize everything in the vacuum, and then you put some number of, uh, you put a Fox state, uh, some number here and some other number here. Then you execute this unitary transformation that maps the initial state onto the eigenstates of the final Hamiltonian after the chemical bond has been broken. And when you execute that using these ancilla transmons, they are supposed to end up back in their ground state. And so a nice error flag occurs if they do not end up back in their ground state, there's almost certainly an error in the cavity state. So we do a check and we post select away, uh, we reject five to 10% of the runs uh, because one of the three ancillas did not end up in the ground state. And then we measure the number of photons uh, in each cavity with these um, number resolving measurements. So let's look a little deeper inside the, uh, this unitary transformation. So uh, first we, uh, uh, you, can break, you can break it down into a sequence of unitaries in which you squeeze cavity A, you squeeze cavity B, you turn on a beam splitter between them to rotate the normal modes because of the, that symmetry breaking, and then a different squeeze on each one, and then a different displacement on each cavity. And that will generate 
in the harmonic oscillator approximation, the transformation from one potential energy surface to the other. So here is some experimental data for photoionization of water, in this case, starting in a, a Gaussian state, the vacuum um, uh, uh, vibrational state. And um, you can see we talk to chemists because we're using <laughs> wave number units and, uh, instead of uh, sensible physics units. And um, the we know the, uh, the potential energy surfaces. So we know from classical calculations, you know, what the frequencies of the new modes are. So we know where these spectral lines are, but we, and we, and a classical computer can say what the probability of shaking up uh, seven, seven uh, excitations in one mode and, and uh, 11 in another, that determines the height of these peaks. We run the simulator and we measure using the slow method, the, the uh, is the photon number uh, seven in one cavity and 11 in another cavity. And of course, most of the time the answer is no, it's very inefficient, but you can build up statistics. And the measurement results give the, the purple dots correspond very well to the predicted, uh, the theoretically uh, exact Frank Condon factors. A measure of the distance between the theoretical and experimental distributions is this L1 uh, norm. Uh, measuring the distance between the theoretical probability that there are I photons in one cavity and J photons in the other cavity and the experimental one. And the uh, distance is about 5%. I mean, you can see by I that it's uh, quite good agreement. If you use this exponentially more efficient uh, quantum non-demolition measurements uh, to extract eight, four bits of information in each cavity, so eight bits of information on the photon number distribution, the error, the distance is about 15%, but this is exponentially faster. In this case, uh, 256 over log 256, so 32 times uh, faster than this scheme. And the error is about three times worse because you have to do a sequence and again, this is quantum non-demolition measurements uh, with four consecutive uh, measurements of the bits uh, of the photon number uh, without resetting uh, the cavity in between. Um, so this is a pretty powerful way of measuring. It's, it's uh, typical photo detectors are not very good at number resolving and they're destructive. We have quantum non-demolition single shot boson number sampling. We measure which of 256 photon states the two cavities are in, um, uh, 16 possibilities in each cavity, by measuring these eight bits of information. And again, the com circuit complexity cost is log of the uh, maximum number, not linear in the maximum number. So it's true boson sampling. Um, the, the use of microwave bosons to simulate vibrational bosons is highly hardware efficient and advantageous. We did an estimate of what it would take on a, if I can call it a traditional quantum computer based on qubits to represent the oscillators and represent simple things like displacements and squeezing is very complicated when you have qubits. So it would have required uh, eight qubits just to hold the, the photon states, many more to do the very complex gates that were required. And that they would need of order a thousand such gates with weights uh, you know, up to eight. Uh, in, an, in a traditional quantum computer. So, so something that's completely impossible at the present state of the art, and yet was relatively easy in this very simple apparatus with two resonators and three transmons. 
And here you see an example of a non-Gaussian initial state with uh, ozone with uh, one vibrational quanta in the stretch and one in the bend and two in the bend. And you see completely different shape spectra, of course. So uh, I didn't talk about quantum error correction, but uh, uh, my take home messages are that both quantum error correction and quantum simulations of physical models containing bosons are much more efficiently done if your hardware actually contains native bosons, in particular microwave photons. And uh, simple instruction set architectures can be constructed that allow you to efficiently synthesize essentially any uh, unitary transformation. Uh, we can't do, you know, thousands of photons, but we can do uh, uh, have efficient control over 256 photon states spread over two uh, cavities. So, and hope to do better in the future. So uh, here's uh, Chris Wang and Jacob Curtis who led the experiment I showed you on the uh, Frank Condon factors in the Shulkoff lab. Here are some actual chemists that we uh, learned a lot from about this problem. Uh, Ai Chuang helped us do the circuit complexity analysis for the traditional quantum computer. And uh, I showed you um, GKP states from the uh, Devere Lab, with whom we also collaborate. So I'll stop there and uh, be happy to answer questions.